Welcome to the Wednesday, September 21st, 2022 Thurston County Planning Commission meeting. The Thurston County Planning Commission is a citizen's advisory committee to the Board of County Commissioners on land use planning matters, such as the comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance amendments. Planning Commission actions are in the form of recommendations to the County Commissioners who are the final decision makers. All Planning Commission meetings are open to the public. Citizens are welcome to observe all Planning Commission briefings and work sessions. Public comment is allowed on those topics for which public hearing has not yet been held. Tonight we'll be holding two public hearings. Uh, so uh, if you're here to comment on either of those, please save those for, save your comments for the hearing instead of the normal public comment portion of our regular meeting. Uh, with that, my name is Eric Casino. I'm this season's chair of the Planning Commission and I reside in District 2. And we will do um, introductions of the rest of the commission starting online with Commissioner Pestinger. Kevin, are you there? Looks like you're still muted. Can you hear me now? Yep, yep. Kevin Pestinger, District 1. Joel Hansen, District 3. Jim Simmons, District 3. District 1. Scott Nelson, District 3. Doug Carmen, District 2. Barry Halverson, District 2. Derek Day, District 1. Thank you very much. Has everybody had a chance to look over this evening's agenda? And if so, I entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded. Call for the vote. Commissioner oh, Pexinger? Uh, aye. Commissioner Hansen? Aye. Commissioner Simmons? Aye. Commissioner Wheatley? Aye. Commissioner Nelson? Aye. Commissioner Carmen? Aye. Commissioner Halverson? Aye. Commissioner Day? Aye. Commissioner Casino? Aye. So the agenda is accepted. Has everybody had a chance to look over the August 17th, 2022 meeting minutes? With that, is there any discussion on the meeting minutes? I'd entertain a motion. Accept the as the official record. Second. Here we have a motion to accept the meeting minutes of August 17th, 2022, and accept the audio as the official meeting record. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, call for the vote. Mr. Passinger? Aye. Mr. Hansen? Aye. Mr. Simmons? Aye. Mr. Wheatley? Aye. Commissioner Nelson? Aye. Commissioner Carmen? Aye. Commissioner Halverson? Aye. Commissioner Day? Aye. Mr. Casino? Aye, the, the uh, meeting minutes are accepted as revenue. With that, we'll move on to the public communication portion of our meeting. Um, I don't see anybody here in the boardroom at all. Is there, do we have somebody online? We have two online. Or two, we do have two online. Okay, I'll run through the rules then. Uh, those participating by Zoom, please choose the raise your hand option if you wish to address the Planning Commission. You'll be promoted to a panelist when it's your turn to speak and be seen. To be seen, please turn on your camera. If you're dialing in, press star nine to raise your hand. Make sure you also choose star six to unmute yourself. The three minute timer will show on the video screens to help you keep track of time. And once you unmute yourself, you generally gotta wait about three seconds before you start speaking because we have a little bit of a lag. So with that, we'll start with, um, I can't read. David Sawyer. David Sawyer, you're up first, David. You don't want to have their hands up though. Oh, no, nobody, nobody has their hands up. Nope. Okay. Well, with that, I guess we are done with the uh, public communication portion of this meeting. And so we will work on agenda item number four, which is a work session on the Grand Mound sub area plan with uh, planners Caitlin Nelson and Amelia Schwartz. Yeah. 
Okay. Good evening. Uh, I am Caitlin Nelson. Um, we are going to start going over this and then we will uh, move on to the uh, public hearings and then we'll go back to this. Um, we presented on September 7th. Uh, some of you asked for additional info. Uh, one of the topics discussed was agriculture and whether uh, air mount supports agricultural uses. Several of the zones do support uses related to agriculture, and Stephen Bramwell, uh, the WSU Extension, has had some discussion with staff since that meeting. Uh, and he will discuss it more with others interested in agriculture, uh, but doesn't currently see any critical conditions in what we have provided in the draft. There were also some questions on MAPA standards. Um, so we had a couple of concerns with the lot list standards. The uh, commissioner wanted to know if we had looked at minimum lot lists at other, in other zones, and then what other lot types were similar to the existing R3 through 6 and R4 through 16. So I had originally looked at as many zones as I could, um, including those in rural areas. Um, however, these are the ones that are existing in some of the towns, municipal areas that the commissioner did mention. If you do notice, I think only one of them actually have a minimum lot width. Most do not even mention a minimum lot width, so I didn't compare them. Uh, them sorry. <laughs> and then you'll also notice the densities are much lower for most of these. They are one unit per five acres rather than three to six units per one acre or four to 16 units per one acre. But there was one, however, it was once again not the same density level. But I did go ahead and add the minimum lot puts, and they are almost similar to the proposal that we have. All right. Then there are two other lot types similar to R3 to 6 and R4 to 16. However, it is a residential Amir. And it's two to one, and then it is a geologically sensitive area district. So once again, pretty di different than what we were looking at. Neither of them have waterfront types, though. So they're almost they're 90% similar, but once again, no waterfront types. But the waterfront types, the only other zoning classification with a waterfront type in the county code is R36 over R4. The only one is R361. So it's the only one having this waterfront type. So it's up to you guys if you want to keep that in or not. Uh, we do have one uh, large stream that goes through, and it is Prairie Creek. No other significant water bodies or mining, mining pools or anything are in the area. And then the SMP boundary doesn't get into that zone. It ends right before. So we don't have SMP in here. But we do have Prairie Creek, and I did try to add a imagery image here so you can kind of see the forest the area that follows along. Right. You want to ask questions at the end? Let's go that now, actually. Can you back up one Oh, let's see. Yes. So, do we know what the uh, CFM for that creek is? I do not do know. From the CFM. It, does it fall under the SMP? Not the portion that is within the zone. Okay. And and is it an intermittent creek or is it a seasonal creek? In other words, do um, we know? I do not know that. Does does the S and P jurisdiction stop on the I five side or on the western edge? Does does her, hold on? We're we're not sharing the screen, so I'm going to do that real quick, and then I will get to your questions. I, I got it backwards in my head, which way that stream flows now. Yeah, so do I. That's what I think. Yeah. And maybe I saw a color in there throwing me off. Now I think I'm just going crazy. So, what was the question? Where does the SP jurisdiction is it in relation to this picture? It is southwest. It so, is. you okay. can see where. It's coming in okay. down here. That's where the SMP jurisdiction ends. Yeah, and it's it's the buffer of 
the yeah. intersection. Okay, so um, it's not a salmon bearing tree. That I do not know. Okay, the other question I would have is uh, it, it's not shown on our maps here. By the way, I like the maps that you did. Thank you. But is are any of the properties in dispute or in question uh, in the vicinity of that creek? Because I can't tell from this map. Are they in dispute? Are they in, in the yeah, vicinity? I think the Justin property is. That, see, that's what I would like to know. Yeah, it is. I think it's at the. It's just the creek runs just to the south of that property. But so, in our, is in relation to if we want a waterfront type of lot or minimum lot width, it will not change the environmental impacts. None of that is just how we classify stone type width. And the fact that the waterfront lots are only in the residential zones. Uh, so the other properties where the SMP does overlap aren't even applicable to minimum lot sizes uh, for water. Right, for minimum lot sizes, they're not. We were just talking about the creek for any of these changes for light industrial or commercial mm. or anything else. Uh, I, I, my question is, do any of these changes affect that creek? Whether it's light industrial, commercial, residential, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just curious because to me, that would be an impact, particularly if it's salmon habitat. So, yes, there are a couple of requested citizen requested amendments in which those parcels also include the creek or um the mapped buffer as it's shown so maybe it's something we can what we should get to when we start talking about the actual um, amendments at the moment we're just talking about the a lot less size this year understand okay. so do any of those concerns tie into your questions about lot widths specifically minimum lot widths are with if I mean, are we thinking about that you'd have different standards on the creek that you'd have different lot sizes not necessarily lot sizes, but zoning requirements or um, buffer widths, like we do in the SMP, et cetera. And the minimum lot width would not impact those. Just the minimum lot width. And no other creek, no other river, some does not have waterfront lot types. That's why I asked if it was 20 CFM or, or more, because that is what the SMP takes into consideration. And then the setback for that would have to be 200 feet. And that would substantially impact possibly the light industrial and commercial, et cetera. Yeah, I, mean, I was actually wondering if we could have a dirt map that shows, you know, because I was thinking about open space areas, buffers, you know, where is that, the, the critical aquifer? That's a lot, I mean, that's a lot of that here, isn't there? So could there be like a hydro? Know, like a hydrological buffer zone kind of map where we can have a sense of how that works through. It would be helpful, I think. I, I guess on when it comes to the impacts of whether or not we have minimum lot sizes here on these parcels that the creek is running through, if we did have minimum lot sizes, then once the other environmental setbacks are put in place on that creek to protect that creek. When somebody comes in and does a short plat, then they're going, if they had minimum lot sizes, they would not be able to condense down as many uh, single family home building lots on that parcel then would they? Possibly, so, it depends. I mean, how much of each parcel that they'd be wanting to split would be taken out by that critical area. Yeah. Because obviously if it turns into an undeveloped lot, then it probably wouldn't get it. And that would change the density. But if we had a, a minimum lot width on there, then there's they would lose even more density. So if like all of a sudden the northern portions of these parcels, as they are now, are not developable because they're too close to a creek, there's other setbacks, environmental setbacks for that. Then the southern portions of these lots, when they go through to to develop those, if they do develop it into single family homes. They will be limited on how many of those lots they can put together because of minimum lot widths. And so you would not get the same kind of density out of it because you're losing the top half of or the top portion of these parcels. Is that, is that right? 
if I'm understanding you right, I believe that could be a possibility. I mean, that's probably factored into the buildable lands report too. How many lots you'd be able to get out of these if the zoning changes and you know through this process and how much that you got to set aside because the creek is running through there. I'm not sure what the yes the, the buildable lands analysis does take into consideration some critical uh, areas, specifically like wetlands, creeks, wetlands and creeks. And the critical areas ordinance does still apply to all these properties. Yeah, yeah. I just like, like, I don't know how big each one of these parcels is. They look fairly uniform. But if all of a sudden you're losing a third or a half of them, and then you also have minimum lot sizes that make it so a lot has to be so big, then a lot of those single family residential lots are, are going to evaporate. They won't be yeah. severely limited. And you might do things, you might limit things like cluster development. If you did that. Yes. I, I don't know how calling those waterfront or not would change any of that, but those are all kind of a separate issue with whether or not we have a waterfront designation. Yeah, so it's kind of like, do you guys think the waterfront I, I, minimum lot size is actually helpful or not? Well, I, those are two different things, whether or not we have a minimum lot size or whether or not we call them waterfront, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I personally don't think that having a waterfront thing a waterfront designation actually does anything. I don't think it actually helps anything. But I, I do not want to put minimum lot sizes on it where all of a sudden we have larger lots than what is actually needed. So what you're considering is, I apologize. No, go ahead. Um, is just not having minimum lots like- um, I'm not real big on minimum lots. Okay. I, I think that market forces can take care of a lot of that stuff. And I think that density is a friend to, to uh, this kind of thing and it, it creates efficiencies so if all of a sudden everybody has to have one third acre lots instead of nine thousand square foot lots i don't think that's necessarily a good thing okay it would put it similar to some of these other yeah. smaller yeah. town rural areas so mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't be a standalone thing to not have a yeah. minimum lot. of course i could be wrong on any of that everybody else should have an opinion on this particular issue don't let me speak for the whole group but it's something to consider Thank you. Well, if you have three to six in an acre, I mean, the lot width is going to be a lot width. You know, put six houses on a, an acre, it's divided into six, and it is what it is, right? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. They might not be able to put six per acre. You might have to do some pretty creative things with those lot lines. Yeah. A lot, lot of it is what the dimensions of it end yeah. up looking like. And access roads and infra other infrastructure. How that will come through. Scott, you look like you had something to say on it. No, I mean, I'm pretty much in agreement with what you said. I think, you know, especially when we're talking about things with, I mean, I think it's double edged. I think if you're talking about large lots, you don't need, because five acres, you wouldn't care what your minimum is unless you, you know, you need a driveway mm -hmm. if you've got an odd shaped parcel. With these, I mean, the idea is to fit these houses onto these properties. And I think the the bigger the lot size, I mean, as long as your lot is sized so that you can meet the building code setbacks, because mm -hmm. obviously your house has to be, everything has to be a certain distance from the line. So, you know, I think design it that way rather than worry about, you know, you have to have, I mean, I guess to me, minimum line, I guess I would maybe think like a 20 foot. So if you've got an odd sized parcel, you know you have enough room Doesn't that get for a road. In the flag lot language. I thought that would get picked up in flag lot language. But I mean, so whatever you do, you've got, I mean, you need to be able to have access and depending on what kind of access, you know, if you've got a driveway with three or more houses in Thurston County, it has to have an actual road to it. So there's 20 foot. Mm -hmm. And so that would, I guess that would, thinking about it, that might be where I would think to go. Do you think that, that talking about the width of the lot is the way to do that, not just having that in other development standards? Thank you.
For sure. sure. Wheatley, you look like you're about ready to say something. No. <laughs> so are you suggesting we don't have lot no. width? I'm, I'm suggesting that we don't have minimum lot width, and I'm su also just suggesting that having any kind of designation for waterfront in this area doesn't actually do anything, so it's not worth doing. And I would like to pipe in for a point of clarification. So like Scott, uh, Commissioner Nelson, you were mentioning, there will still be other development standards like the access width. So they won't be able to just throw up a two foot lot and call it a day. We do still have other development standards that would require vehicle access, emergency vehicle access. So <laughs> no minimum lot width doesn't just mean we're throwing rules out really nilly. There's other things that would keep it a standard. I would agree with no minimum I, I would want to hear some pushback against me. The, the one area that parking is what concerns me. Mm -hmm. um, anybody who is, is anybody here live on a cul-de-sac? My son just moved into a cul-de-sac and there are cars everywhere because there's no places to park. I mean, they're parked behind each other out in the middle of the thing because you don't have enough room on your property to park your car. And, and the same thing with these uh, houses that are um, like in Hawks Prairie, where they've got they're like townhouses, they're so close together that and they got a, uh, an alleyway in the backyard. And you know, I've had friends who've had their windshields broken out because the neighbor's upset because they're parked in the alley. And there's no place to park. So I look at width of your property as a place to park. And when it's so small that there's no room for any cars, where does where does your company park? That's my concern. Is part. Having enough room. Commissioner, do you have anything on this one? Commissioner Pestinger, do you have an opinion on this particular issue? Nope. Well, <laughs> I would say to to Doug's question, um, I don't remember everything we have, but I know like. Two years ago, we did LID stuff, and there was parking requirements. And I know when we did Tomorrow UGA, I think there was parking requirements. I mean, of course, the problem is you build a house and you've got a requirement of two, maybe two and a half parking spots. Mm -hmm. You know, you got a family of four, two kids in high school. You've probably got four cars and people coming over. So I don't know. I mean, and with with single family lots, I don't know how we get around that. My, my concern with that is that's a private problem that you're asking yeah. for a public solution. And if you have more cars in your household than your lot requires and you expect the rest of the world to provide space out in front of your house on the road, that's that's asking a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And especially if we're talking about this area here where we want to encourage infill and more housing and housing that isn't Taj Mahal style housing that people can get into more affordably by putting in requirements of wider lots and more parking, you're just making that that much more difficult. And so I'm not saying that this is a low income housing project, but if we looked at it through that lens to a certain degree, I think that uh, the, the community would benefit from it. Are there, are there provisions other where, other places for parking? Yes, I believe we have some parking zoning has, has parking provisions. Just know that if you, the planning commission as a whole is looking to um, remove lot widths as a standard, um, that does mean that there will be different size lots. I mean, they won't, you won't have a subdivision that has standardization in your subdivision. Um, you won't see, uh, you could very well see um, fairly small lots within this particular area because we are talking about higher density zoning, where what you're seeing on the screen here in comparison is very rural zoning, where at minimum you have a one acre lot well, we're talking about very small, almost urban lots on these particular areas. So I just want to make sure that the planning commission is taking all of that into consideration as they're thinking about potentially not having any lot width requirements. 
Well, we got two issues on, on the plate that we need to, to make a decision on. The first one being, is the wetland designation actually useful in this particular area? Or, or I'm sorry, yeah. water, <laughs> water, <laughs> yeah. is the waterfront designation, is that important enough that we should consider keeping or putting that in there? I personally don't think it is. If, if anybody wants to push back on that, I'd love to hear it. Well, can, can you just explain one more time? What is, what is the advantage of that? Just that it keeps the property sizes larger along the waterfront, the area that's designated waterfront, or what, what's the point of a waterfront designation? Unfortunately, it wasn't written out um, any reasoning in the code for that. Most likely, yes. Uh, you also have to keep in mind that the existing code has nine different types of minimum lot widths. That one is just the one that we picked out as maybe we don't need this. You also can say you want there to be one instead of nine, or as you mentioned, none, but uh, waterfront is just one of the ones that we're discussing. So the places along the, the stream, they're still, in some, they're still kind of, uh, they're still required to do the ecological stuff, is that right? Yes. Yeah, I, I go away as long as they're the stream still being protected. Miss Shirley, we you have more. Oh, I'm just, you know, I'm I'm really struggling with this because I'm sort of feeling like, well, this whole issue is never what lit. What lit? I don't know. Um, <laughs> is quick as yeah. you um, uh, I don't know. Nasty. I don't think okay. so. Okay. It's on the top. Is that better? Is that better? Check both. Turn them on. As in, they should both be on now. <laughs> I, I don't know what's. Yeah, I think it was on already. I'm not sure. Okay. So, uh, I see a light. The green yeah, light's on. Is, yeah, the green lights are on. Okay. Okay. Where was I? Oh, well, okay. So, I mean, I'm trying to think of this, you know, sort of uh, the 10,000 foot level and you know, it would be really nice to have a map where we could see sort of where those potential buffer zones and things are going to need to be, you know, so that we have a sense of how it cuts through the different zoning. But it, it seems like it's the residential, um, you know, the R3 that takes a pretty big hit in terms of where the creek flows, if I remember right, but I can't really see it. So, so a lot of what we're talking about has to do with seems like this this r3 area and then the the ac stuff um and the ac it seems like that's less of an issue the problem with it going through the through the r3 is that it's not clear how much of that r3 is going to be sort of affected by the fact that the creeks running through it and what that's going to do to the lots and how usable they are. So I guess that's what I'm struggling to understand um, mm -hmm. because it does seem like an important question for those R3 lots. But then connected to that is that question about where to put the R416 um, lots. If, if, you know, one of the proposals is to uh, basically take the stuff along old highway 99 and take it from residential to, and turn it into AC. You know, I've been puzzling about that a bit because we have this proposal to extend the UGA off of 198, the Swamovsky property. And, you know, the more I think about it, it, it makes sense in a lot of ways, you know, and, you know, to, to sort of put the put the neighborhoods along 198 there. Um, yeah. So so in that sense, it, it, if we're talking about really aiming for putting the density up there, it's not affected by the creek or any of that. Um, so um, this is a good conversation, but it is seven o'clock. Yeah. Uh, so we'll need to come back to this uh, after the public hearing. Okay, well, let's move on to these two particular questions for now.
we will move on to our public hearing. So our first public hearing that we'll be hearing is on CPA Core Capital Improvement Program. Today we are here to hold a public hearing on the comprehensive plan amendment docket item number CPA number four, Capital Improvement Program or CIP. This is a hybrid public hearing. Those wishing to testify have appeared in person or are joined by Zoom, phone, emailed in comment, or mailed in comment. If you wish to testify, please, for those who are in person, please sign in. Uh, for those on Zoom, for those on Zoom, uh, please choose the raise your hand option. You will be promoted to a panelist when it is your turn to speak. To be seen, please turn on your camera. If you are dialing in, press star nine to raise your hand. Make sure you also choose star six to unmute yourself. The three minute timer will show on one of the videos to help keep back track of time. We're gonna start out with um, online. If there, if there is anybody online that would like to provide testimony during this public hearing. No hands? Hey, did we move? Oh, we do not have anybody signed up for uh, capital improvement program public hearing either, unless there's somebody in the audience that would like to. Well, that makes it easy. Um, I guess we'll move on to a staff presentation. Have a good one. Um, okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for community planning. Um, today we're holding a public hearing on the 2022-2023 official comprehensive plan amendment docket item CPA4, uh, the Capital Improvement Program or CIP. The Capital Improvement Program is the Thurston County government's six-year plan for investment projects for unincorporated areas of Thurston County. The plan is reviewed and updated annually with the county budget and, and is known as a Phoenix G of the county's comprehensive plan. The purpose of tonight's hearing is to make a recommendation on the 2023 20, through 2028 CIP document. Staff initiated noticing for this project and published a legal notice on August 26th and a webinar as well on August 26th. A press release was issued on September 12th. The Thurston County Community Planning webpage was updated with all available documents for tonight's hearing. As of today, September 21st at 530, staff has received zero comments on this proposal. Thank you. Boy, that's it, huh? Well, um, with that, this public hearing is closed, and we can start the work session on the issue. So, have anything for the work session? Um, we have some staff available to answer any questions if you have additional questions. Otherwise, I did provide each of you a copy of the motion, uh, an optional motion for you to consider when you go here. All right. I, I would love to hear from uh, Assistant County Manager Robin Campbell. So if we could find a spot for her to address us, that would be great. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, commissioners, uh, thank you for hearing this item. The capital improvement plan is a very important document to the county where we lay out all of our um, public and infrastructure works intended for the coming six years. And uh, I am here in person this evening and I'm joined uh, virtually by all of the staff who have a part in preparing this document and we would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Barry, do you want to start? Maybe it's just a point of clarification for me. I mean, last time we talked about uh, the facilities plan, the uh, million dollar bond. Uh, and some of that was, well, all of it, I guess, was REAP money to pay for the bond. That's correct. Okay. And that was REIT 1? REIT 1. Okay. I mean, so REIT 1 can be used for what purposes? So REIT 1 can be used for any of the things that REIT 2 can be used for, which is um, public-facing infrastructure, roads, water, sewer, uh, sidewalks, lighting, um, anything really 
that uh, culverts, uh, any of those types of things that you can re use REIT 2 for, plus the unique thing about REIT 1 is it can be used for um, county-owned facilities. And it is the only fund that the county has with that designation. Um, so that is what the board intends to use REIT 1 for. And we issued 45 million in bonds, not 60, um, just yesterday. Today's Wednesday. So just yesterday, we conducted the bond sale. Okay. So it's gone down from 60 to 45? That is the amount that we chose to issue, yes. And we at no time intended to issue 60 million in bonds at this time. Uh, we think that the project um, could be up to 60 million, but the project price will be contained, if you will, by the amount of money available. Okay, that was going to be my next question. So right now we're having an economic downturn. Uh, we've got high inflation. Um, we may be going into a recession if we're not in one already, which means that buying power for the, the people out there is going to drop. And REIT is based on the sale of houses, mortgage our mortgages are going any, up. Any real estate transaction, yes. Right. So mortgage rates have gone up to their highest level in 40 years right now. So there's going to be fewer houses sold, probably less revenue uh, as a result of REIT funding. Uh, so I, my question is, and that, I think you just answered it. So the amount is based on how much we get from REIT 1 uh, versus a specific amount. That's true. So how do we cover the bond if it doesn't come up to $45 million? So the bond, uh, the bond is issued for $45 million, And at this time, even if we have a downturn in REIT uh, revenues, um, and I've, I've forecasted uh, no growth in the coming years, um, but I also prepared a model for the board that showed a decrease in REIT in the next two years, uh, much like the state forecast does. And even with that, since this bond is the only thing that REIT will pay for, uh, there is capacity to cover the debt. If, however, the um, fund does not generate sufficient revenue to make the debt payment, the board is obligated uh, by the terms of the bond to make up the difference from general fund. Okay, so the difference would come out of general fund. Yep. And your forecast for 2023, 2024, and 2025 for the bond that was issued and the REIT dollars that you forecasted right now would cover the $45 million bond. Yes, it would. Okay, thank you. Yep. In, in your forecast, are you thinking that REIT will be used will be exhausted in the debt service of this bond or will there be any money left over, do you think? I think that the next two or three years might be kind of tight, but um, after that, we will have paid off all other debt that is paid from REIT 1. That creates some capacity. And then what you see in a normal economic cycle, yes, there's a downturn, but then it rebounds uh, in many years pretty significantly. Um, there's also the restructure of the way that REIT is charged. It had been um, one quarter of 1% on the sale, <clears throat> and now there is a graduated um, amount depending on the price of the uh, transaction. Above so, 500000 versus... Yeah, and then, then again above, uh, I believe, a million. Right. Um, and we think that that is part of the reason that we've generated so much in the last two years. Right. Um, so we think in future years, there's going to be capacity to do other work on the buildings that needs to be done. You also said that REIT 1 was unique and that it can be used for county-owned facilities. And I'm assuming that the other part of that would be that REIT 2 cannot be used or could be used. Or REIT 2 cannot be used for county-owned buildings. And when you say REIT 1 can be used, is it can be used or must be used for county-owned? No, may, may be okay. used for the things. It, it can only be used for infrastructure purposes, mm -hmm. um, but uh, public-facing infrastructure plus 
county owned facilities is REIT 1. I know that I mentioned before that I have heartburn over not having a really good definition of what a capital facility is. Is there, is there a way we can change that and relieve my heartburn by <laughs> getting a um, real definition of that? I know you said that that Igla said it does it's not required. That's right. But I would sure feel better about it if we actually had, I mean, every other accounting practice has a definition for stuff that I think. If, if we're talking about accounting practices, there are accounting definitions for capital, what you capitalize mm -hmm. in accounting. But this is not accounting. This is a construction plan. Um, and we want to give ourselves a little latitude. Um, and we also want to um, not include minutia, if you will, or not include things in this plan before they're more than just uh, wishful thinking, if you will. Um, so I'd be happy to have a conversation with Public Works and Central Services and our attorneys about that for next year's plan, but not awesome. for this year's plan. That would be awesome. Commissioner Carmen, So if we can use Street One for county owned, buildings. We can also use it for leased buildings. We can use it for improvements made on buildings that the county will lease. And the prime example of that right now is the 3000 Pacific building. Um, we have we have a attorney general's opinion uh, that states that as long as the lease is for a public purpose, um, which is the housing of county owned facilities, then we can pay for the improvements to the building, whether we own it or not. And then um, the county does not have a policy of set asides for roads in the future. Is that correct? policy of set-asides. Help me understand what you're... Where asking. roads are going to be in the future, if you're going to take roads oh, and extend uh, set them. set-aside of property. Yeah, setting, um, setting I would turn that question over to Scott Lindblom. He's our county engineer. Uh, good evening, Scott Lindblom, uh, county engineer. Um, and no, we do not have a set-aside for that. Do you have anything, Commissioner? Do you have anything? No. Joel, do you have anything for Ms. Campbell? Can come up here. Just one follow up: the, the facility that you're talking about, the lease facility, is that the atrium? Yeah, that's that's the other name. There's AKA. Yeah, yeah. three thousand Pacific is the address. Okay. Or, the atrium. All right, thank you. Commissioner Pessinger, do you have anything for the assistant county manager or any of the staff? Nope. Uh, any final <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for coming in and speaking with us. And thank you, everybody on the line, for coming in for us. Um, thank you. With that, um, if anybody has. All right. I move next to approval of amendments to Appendix G of Thurston County Comprehensive Plan, the 2023 to 2028 Capital Improvement Program by repealing and replacing the 2022 to 2027 Capital Improvement Program in its entirety. It's been moved. Is there a second? A second. All right. Uh, any discussion? I do. Go ahead. While I'm in favor of the motion, I would like to see us send a letter along with it to the Board of County Commissioners recommending that they establish a set aside program for future roads in the county so we don't end up with problems like we have with uh, College where you can't widen the road anymore because they didn't, put, they didn't have enough land uh, or dead end the road in the T. Somebody was coming to the front of it. So I think it is prudent and, and, and good planning to plan roads ahead. So my 
So you're you're moving to amend. I'm not amending it. I'm, I'm saying we're done with this. Okay, we'll bring up when you're done with it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve the amendment to Appendix G of the Person County Comprehensive Plan, the 2023 through 2028 Capital Improvement Program, by repealing and replacing the 2022 through 2027 Capital Improvement Program in its entirety. With that, I call for the vote. Commissioner Fessinger. Aye. Commissioner Hansen. Aye. Commissioner Simmons. Aye. Commissioner Wheatley. Aye. Commissioner Nelson. Aye. Commissioner Carmen. Aye. Commissioner Halverson. Aye. Commissioner Day. Aye. Commissioner Casino. Uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Now, do you want to? I would like to make a motion. That Speak we, motion. <laughs> that we uh, pass along with the capital improvement program the recommendation that the board of county commissioners consider uh, developing a policy for road set aside in future for future development. Mm -hmm. Right? Is there a second on that motion? Can I offer a friendly amendment? You can offer it. Friendly. Um, so I think what we're really talking about is probably long range transportation planning. Um, I think if it were more comprehensive, I think that kind of signal to the board might be appropriate. You got any suggestions on the mechanics of that? Um, well, I think in the same way that you're talking about where roads would go, I think it would be just a more comprehensive look at. Um, long range transportation. So go ahead, Ms. Well, I I think I'm a, I'm opposed to it because there's another place to talk about transportation planning in, in the planning universe, and and this may not be quite the right place. I understand. Sort of hang it on the capital improvement. I think you have an issue that's worth talking about. I'm not you don't think this is persuaded this for. is quite right. the only reason I tell I wanted to tag it on with this is because we're talking about roads and, yeah. and improvement improving things. When we did the comp plan last time, I brought the issue up then and told by the transportation department of transportation, well, regional transit people look at that stuff. Well, they don't. And so we, we have roads that go nowhere. And then we have some of the crummiest roads in, in, the, in the state because they haven't been thought out. I mean, not you know, built properly. I just mean, I mean, the road goes here and it goes over there because we put a housing development in front of the road. And so I just think that we need to send a message to the yeah. They ought to think through. Yeah. Think that through. But roads, uh, uh, as, as, we keep building houses closer and closer and closer together and put more and more people per acre. Roads become more important in getting people out of places, you know, north and south, east and west. So they're commuting from Seattle or whatever they're doing. You can't keep putting people on the same two lane roads. Add a 2000 home development and you don't change the road. Or you built some close to the road, but now you can no longer widen the road. To make it three lanes or to make it four. Well, we have a motion, and if there's a second, we can take a vote. If not, we'll probably have to take this up in another area because I think it is something that we should discuss at some point. So, is there a second to Commissioner Carmen's motion? Sorry about that. Yep. We'll bring it up at another time because I think it's an important subject. All right. Well, with that, we will move on to um, item seven, which is another public hearing. And it's public hearing on the uh, A22 boundary line adjustment code. And with that, we have uh, uh, Andrew Bond with us again. Um, so I'm opening this public hearing. Today we are here to hold a public hearing on development code docket item A22 boundary line adjustment code. Uh, and we will start out with a presentation from Andrew Bond. Good evening again. Andrew Bond here with Community Planning. Today we're here to hold a public hearing on development code docket item A22, boundary line uh, adjustment code amendment. The purpose of the amendment is to bring the current lake, lake 
excuse me, their current language into compliance with RCW 5817-0406 and recent case law. The proposed amendment will improve the application review process by defining review procedures and required application materials, as well as other regulatory requirements. Staff initiated, excuse me, staff initiated public noticing by publishing a legal notice in the Olympian on August 26, 2022, as well as sending, sending a letter to interested parties on August 22, 26, 2022. A press release was issued on September 12th, and the Thurston County Community Planning updated its webpage with all available documents considered for tonight's meeting. As of today, we received two public comments related to this proposal. Um, both public comments relate to the role professional land surveyor surveyors play within a boundary line adjustment application, um, as well as different materials that, we sh that should be required for uh, a BLA. And one of the comments did also provide a model ordinance as reference. Thank you. All right, with that, we're gonna open it up to um, public comment. And do we have anybody online for public comment tonight? No, no. so we'll open it up to in the boardroom and today we have um, Gary Lettering. I'm Gary Lettering. I'm a private uh, professional land surveyor uh, locally. I'm also the urban member on the State Survey Advisory Board. And several years ago, we put together a model ordinance for boundary line adjustments for counties that didn't have surveyors on staff or small communities that needed some guidance on boundary line adjustments because they're not as easy uh, as people think, and there's no real code that backs those uh, in the state. So what we did was we put it all together, we let everybody review it, and we came with a, up with a group of just minimum requirements necessary to accomplish it, things like quick claim deeds established after the uh, whatever document the county or municipality has for a boundary line adjustment, whatever exhibit they have to require, um, things like that. If you have a mortgage on your property, you're going to definitely want to talk to your bank about that. So we want to include things like mortgage contacting, because if you're selling off a chunk of your property, you might be violating your mortgage and lose your mortgage. Uh, things like that nature. Um, the other thing that I'm here to try to convince you of is that you should bring your code up to date with surrounding counties. Uh, Pierce, uh, Tacoma, Lakewood, uh, Grays Harbor, Mason County, they all require records of surveyors and a, a land surveyor right in that legal description so it can be followed in the future. Uh, we'd also like, as the State Survey Advisory Board, we want to see property corners set at those boundary line adjusted points because somebody buying a piece of property from somebody else wants to see where that line is in the future. And they're going to have to go hire a surveyor down the road to do that. And he may or may not be able to find that depending on who did it, whether or not a record of survey was done or a licensed land server wrote that legal description so it was legible. Uh, so that's what I'm here for. And I brought a couple copies of local ordinances to pass out, um, brought the model ordinance also along, uh, if you want to take a look at that. And uh, I can answer any questions also. Thank you very much. Did you want to provide testimony today? No. Okay. Uh, well, with that, this public hearing is closed. I think we can work into Move into our work session on the issue. Do you have any more? I have any uh, other things to say besides answering the questions in my head. Okay, so we're here to answer some questions. Uh, according to paragraph H1A, uh, an adjusted legal description for each one of the DLA, the adjusted legal description must be prepared and certified by a registered land surveyor mayor or title manager, right? Correct. So a registered land survey must be conducted on the property. So part of uh, a is the certified by a registered land surveyor, surveyor or title company. And those are both existing language that was in the original code. The, the addition into 1B requires that an adjusted boundary be prepared by a registered land surveyor. And so more or less, it has to be done at least like one point during the application process and leaves the coordination with the homeowner, uh, leaves the coordination to establish if it's gonna be a title company or a land surveyor or just go the land surveyor route. We leave that option available to the applicant and the homeowner who's going through the process. But the survey must be filed with the county. 
put on record, correct? Correct. Okay. How does how does that policy differ from our our municipal neighbors? With relation to with the filing policy, yeah, or, yeah, it varies based on the jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions require a record of survey, like uh, the gentleman mentioned. Others require that the final plat be approved by a land surveyor, submitted through the the checklist requirements outlined by that municipality um, and the materials that are required with that application. So it varies based on uh, municipalities throughout the board. Some have more detailed requirements, some have less, just it varies. So this does not require a record of survey? Not, Why not? It leaves additional flexibility for the property owner. The points uh, from a perspective of a large parcel versus a small parcel. Uh, it's a it's a larger burden to put on a homeowner, and uh, with the applications that we currently accept, we accept uh, one that would just be a legal description versus a legal description, which uh, does have, from what I understand, some issues when it comes to the application process. Um, and then we have a plat. Uh, sorry. Uh, survey document with a survey document, but no finite points established on the property. And it leaves it up to the applicants, or uh, leaves no applicants more or less to certify that it's correct. Okay. Really not the best thing. I've been through that. Uh, <laughs> so I guess my question would be, is why can we not include a requirement for a record of survey? You and it's kind of outside of the scope of this update. It wasn't identified by development services as an issue. Um, all the changes outside of the corrections to align it with the recent court cases in state law were just based on just application procedures that they've experienced for the years. And just the additional items included are just things that already are required. It's just being codified in the code. Okay, you may not know the answer to this question. I really don't expect you to, but. but how many cases has the county received where there has not been a record of the survey reported with the county and the points haven't been located on the property, so it's caused a conflict with the development? Do not have an answer for that. Yeah. Can I just make yeah, a comment ahead. kind of related to this? Um, I think, I mean, this is not so much. It seems like the model ordinance that we were provided in the, con in the written comment is interesting to me because it, it's organized in a different way than the way ours is. And that's something that I want to address. The thing that I'm thinking about right now while you're asking your questions is that one of the ways it seems to be organized is according to just so it has different symptoms, but um, is it a single owner adjusting? Is it two properties adjusting? And what's the nature of it? And that there are different levels of requirements for the record of survey according to who's doing it and why they're doing it. And so um, it seems like I think it's right but it seems like there you know there's there's some situations where there'd be that flexibility Other situations, like especially where you have two property owners where you don't have you know where you say no it's a requirement that it's being especially surveyed so um you know what i was thinking about is why, you know i was going to suggest to to get to that because i With a wonky, you know, sort of I have a wonky history survey property. Um, why can't why can't this be paid? You know, right now to me it seems a little strange that all of this is not really its own code. It's all shoehorned into um, code about exemptions. And why can't we pull it out and make it its own code? And then it can be organized in a way where those kinds of uh, points can be addressed there. 
So based on our current uh, Title 16, um, it's laid out essentially with short flats, major flats, and then there's the exemptions. And a boundary line adjustment at the end of the day is an exemption. Um, I think if we were to look at it from a more comprehensive update to Title 16 or the exemption section, that might be something where we look at kind of breaking it into their own individual sections and diving deep. But ultimately, with this update, it primarily addresses the court case issues that uh, put into question the legality of some of our practices and kind of update the code to make it more conducive to the development services staff who are reviewing these on a regular basis and the issue and kind of correct the issues they've identified as kind of reoccurring issues. So I think with what you're describing, I think that goes into a broader update of the boundary line adjustment and uh, kind of takes a different direction for how the county approaches those. So are you saying that this that the way that this is being proposed is the bare minimum to get by with state Correct. law and compliance with court orders? Correct. And it's not a comprehensive update. Yeah, that is correct. And you're saying that but that's too squishy. Yeah, it's awkward. It's very awkward. I mean, I looked at I looked at the model one, and I looked at Pierce County, and I think I might have looked at a couple others. Yeah, yeah, they're their own ordinances. Than what this is, and, and, Andrew. I think you said before that we're like sixteen years out of compliance, or something like that. We're way, way, way far. Yeah, we we started this in two thousand eight. So okay. <laughs> we're just trying to get by. <laughs> so but I think I think what you're kind of referring to is kind of uh, its own docket item that kind of addresses either the exemption chat, like the exemption chapter of Title 16 or a broader look um, at overall every section. And I I'm, the code is quite old. So yeah. it's possible that it might need that refreshing look. It just needs we need the direction from the board of county commissioners to really take a deep dive into that and take a look at what kind of are the best practices, what are uh, things that are kind of obsolete based on current trends, and kind of go with that. But for today's docket item, it's primarily just the bare minimum to get it. To get it. <laughs> we get it okay. I, I think you can tell that that this body, I mean, we're 14, or 15, 16 years out of compliance for bare minimum. How long is it going to take to get Title 16 on the docket for a comprehensive review? Mm -hmm. Will that ever happen? Well, yeah. we do have our comp plan. We have a comp plan coming up, which is the entire comp plan. Which is the place to do that? I, I, would, I mean, I would think so. That yeah, would see where we can go through whatever we want. And how much more work is it to pull this out? And it's like, I think of it like it's in a car. Like, are we going to just, let's just pull the motor? <laughs> that really might be outside our purview, though. Um, our our docket is pretty narrow, even if it is less than satisfactory to just fix the bare minimum. Um, but I, I, I mean, couldn't we couldn't we basically move to like fix the bare minimums, but also like put it on the docket, or maybe we can't put it on the docket, or we can just yeah, 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 yeah. recommend, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, couldn't we recommend as part of the that it become its own? I don't know how you'd phrase it. Comprehensive review. Its own. Yeah, but it's become its own. Yeah, its own. Yeah, it has its own character. So, what I suggest is that if the Planning Commission chooses to move on the docket item that we currently have before them and would like to see a broader look at either this particular section or the chapter in whole, that they do something like they did for the community planning, community agricultural community driven update. I got that all wrong, but um, where the planning commission recommended that the board of county commissioners place on the docket a review of, and to make it a broader review of title 16, or chapter that you address the exemptions or you you want to address the whole right. title with all and not the provide, provide, provide direction within that except for to ask staff to go back and take a look at the chapter of the title 16 that said 
addresses exemptions as a whole and bring, bring back something to the planning commission and then the board to take action on. Okay. Well, that's not, that sounds like a bigger talking about take this language, you know, that's, that's written in a way, you know, to fit as exemptions, um, you know, it, like other jurisdictions have little bits of code. They're only a couple pages long, maybe, or maybe they're five pages long, that's specifically about boundary line adjustments, but it's its own code. It's its own, you know, called boundary line adjustments code. I think what you are describing kind of looks at the hierarchy standards of the code. There are like how like A to I to establish these standards. It doesn't call for specific section chapters in the union code, like for example. Um, it just kind of falls in a, a flow. And so it may be something that you have to look at just the actual how the code is laid out within union code. To really have that standalone section, because otherwise, exemption is uh, boundary line adjustment is an exemption. But and then there's exemptions with it. Yeah, just it's kind of like very exemptions common. to the exemption, <laughs> and it's you know. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, it just seems to me like we're putting a band aid yes. on the headwood. <laughs> okay, and my question to Chris is: We got the comprehensive plan coming up. Mm -hmm. When? We are. We have to have the conference plan completed by June of twenty twenty four or twenty twenty five. Okay, that really does get us there. Uh, we're going to start in twenty twenty four. I I like what we've been the direction that we're kind of going. I, I think that we do need to have a comprehensive review of BLAs, but we do need to get into compliance. This has been lingering for too long, so I would suggest that we move forward with this mandate and we put the headroom either in comprehensive planning review or ask the commissioners to put it on docket separately. And I'm, I'm indifferent on comp plan or separately, but I think we do need to at least um, stop something between now. Go ahead. I have a specific question that yeah. I've done that, that I don't want to. Oh, go ahead. Carmen, go ahead. I, tell you um, I, I want to see us require the survey. I mean, back in 80, I mean, good old boys saying here in the line was with a stake in the ground. I think the place to ask for that was a comprehensive thing because they, they don't have any code ready for doing that. Just get rid of it. Number eight. The lady would be done at the survey. My, my property was, was like very similar. Just like mine. Two sisters said, here's the line. My yeah. house is built on the neighbor's property, you yeah. know? And RHA just went through a lawsuit, twelve thousand five hundred dollars, because there was no survey conducted. That should be a small change. So you're, you're saying go forward. We have to find the plan. I want to. I want to have an official survey. And so you want to register? You want to strike out A? Wait a second. It, no, it's two eight, I think. It says landowners may resolve the location of points and lines between two or more parcels of real property and set forth in RZ without need to apply for a BLA under the owner's cover on the place to come out. So we want to maintain eight just because it is a secondary process that is outside of the BLA as defined by state law that allows uh, the perpetrator to be the mediator versus having to go through the application process. Um, what we can't, there's kind of two options. We, the first would be just part of the recommended motion to approve will be a secondary motion to add um, uh, that a record of survey is required. And then the Board of County Commissioners can take that recommendation and correct staff to formulate, formulate language to incorporate into the current code to ensure that that is accounted for. That would be under eight. Well, it'd be under this. I'm going to find a place for it. All right. So, so in the so that's a motion you want to add in a second recommendation to have a record of service. Do it would be would it be just a, would you want two motions or would you want one and all in one? Okay, do it all in one. <laughs> Uh, before we move forward, Commissioner Simmons, you were looking like you had something to say. I, I had a question. I'll come back to you. No, I, I was trying to think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. 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 Uh, putting it on the docket separately or handling it in the comprehensive plan. Do we have a sense of which would get us there? I would guess that we'd see it in the comp plan review before we'd see it as a standalone, but I don't yeah. know that. Okay. That was my sense. I mean, that's a UCC decision. Commissioner okay. Wheatley? Yeah, this is a real, this is a specific question that I probably should have asked last time, but I, I kind of became alerted to it in that comparison process. It's, um, it's in H4B, uh, legally established existing lot structures or uses shall not be required Now, I was looking at the Pierce County code and it said that the administrator could require uh, corrections to make um, make it conform. Um, and so my question is, is this something that is because of those, you know, to, to meet with current legal decisions? It's not like the language is stricken right there, which says um, only parcel and also qualifies for the site sheets without different things. I don't think with the new language that's put into that spot. Is there any reason why? Um, in addition to doing a boundary line approve adjustment, uh, a non-conforming feature could also be required to conform. If if that were up to, I mean, to leave that to the um, to the administrator rather than putting it into this language here. In other Instead of saying shall not be required to correct existing non conforming features, um, could you say may be required to correct existing non conforming features? I, think, I believe that would open us to a legal conundrum with may, because it leaves it up to interpretation as to what features may be required. I know in general practices in, uh, with boundary line adjustments. A lot of places do not require um, corrections of non-conforming items because none of those items are being touched with the boundary line adjustment. The, the lines are being shifted. They are not allowed to move the lines to create any situation more non-conforming or create a conforming situation into a non-conforming situation. But if they have their driveway placed in the wrong spot, or like it's kind of a a cascading effect with uh, uh, requiring that they correct non conforming situations. Generally speaking, if they do have non conforming situations and they submit any other land use permit, uh, those will be identified and be required to be corrected. This is just a matter of shifting lines to either create a situation that's more conducive for the property or kind of alleviate any sort of non conforming situations that exist. Well, why? say anything at all then i mean why not just leave that sentence out i mean uh i don't know it's just i'm, I'm just curious as to why pierce county sees having a bit of flexibility you know it's sort of they're saying that you can uh require some of these things pierce i don't know i don't have pierce county's code in front of me to yeah uh Right. To that question, yeah, uh, they may have an internal decision that that is the direction they want to take. Um, but generally, from our perspective, we've only looked at it from this is a line that's shifting. You can shift the lines as long as you don't create any other situation that is 
not conforming. Well, I'm just noting, I mean, this is new language. And from what you're telling me, it's new language that isn't in response to, to have that language there in order to conform with legal requirements. It's something that the county thinks would be helpful to have. It's, I would say it is codifying that it is clear that the expectations we will not be reviewing your zoning situation on the site. We will only be looking at the boundary line adjustment and the location of the line and any sort of other easement or subdivision related features. And that's true. If your zoning is ever changed and it becomes um, your property will essentially become legal non conforming, you, you existed prior to that zoning going into place. And so you will continue on. If you, you the only issues that you ever come up with is if you ever try to expand or uh, add another unit, that's where you'll have the conflicts with the current. I get that. But you know, when I, when I, again, when I see this. Just because you want to find your meal. Yeah. Yeah. My understanding is you wouldn't have to do that. Right. That's kind of the way. But the county records are going to indicate that the property is non conforming. The property, uh, but at the end of the day, with at least with the current code proposed, even if it is non conforming, that will not be taken into consideration. We won't. No, I understand, yeah. but the county records would indicate the property is non conforming. So whenever you sold it, it would indicate that on the sale. Mm -hmm. Or if you submitted a right. sort of land use permit, right. it would come up. Does anybody else have anything on this issue? Commissioner Kessinger, we haven't heard from you on this particular topic. Do you have anything? Nope. <laughs> right, thank you. With that, um, I would entertain a motion on this particular issue. Uh, I recommend a uh, motion to approve uh, development code docket item 822 boundary line adjustment. To consider amendments to the revised code amendment on boundary line adjustment standards in chapter 18.04 and a revised definition on building site in chapter 18.08 and require a survey of weapons. How you put that in there? That's it. Okay, it's been seconded. Is there any other discussion on this motion? Okay, so the motion is to recommend approval of development code docket item A22 boundary line assessment to consider amendments to the Thurston County Code for new and revised code language on boundary line adjustment standards in chapter 18.04 and a revised definition on building site in chapter 18.08 to include a requirement for a survey of record. Without a call for the vote. Commissioner Pestinger. No. Nay. Commissioner Hansen. Aye. Commissioner Simmons. Aye. Commissioner Wheatley. Commissioner Nelson. Aye. Commissioner Carmen. Aye. Commissioner Hulston. Aye. Commissioner Dane. Aye. Commissioner Casino. Aye. That motion passes seven to two. With that, would there be any, I would entertain another motion if somebody wanted to address the topic of recognition the BOCC put something else on our docket or comp plan. I think what it'd be title 16, right? Can I make my own motion as a chair? Probably. I, I would mean that we make recognition of the OCC that we have a comprehensive review of title 16. Title 18, that's right. That is separate from the standard comp plan review. They may not pick up from one side or the other, which I don't know which would come first. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. And the motion is to recommend to the BOCC that we have a comprehensive review of Title 18 on boundary line adjustments. Standards. Or subdivision standards. Or subdivision standards. Because 
or, or specify uh, the specific section that it's 18.04, which has the standards for bound line adjustment. It's either comprehensive of all the subdivision regulations or identify like the exemptions. I'm going to go with comprehensive. In my, I want all. Yeah, I'm going with comprehensive in my motion. So it's been yeah. seconded to recommend VOCC add a doc guidance for comprehensive title uh, Any further discussion on that? Well, I think it's just, I mean, we've got the comprehensive plan review coming up. And you think it gets quite frankly, this either this is not going to get done or it's going to be one more thing put in front of the comprehensive plan review. And I think, I mean, I think also the planning commission has more leeway because the county commission has been put some side walls on us for the doc plan. It's comprehensive plan review. Comprehensive plan is being reviewed. And it's everything is open. Comprehensive, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, so you think we would have work to review by I mean, reading I think we would if I would. And that's more important than the time of trying to get this in front of us sooner. Well, if we get it in front of us sooner, it's going to push Constant. the comprehensive plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, fair yeah, enough. We don't want to shoot down my motion. That's fine. I'm, your reasoning is sound with me. Well, it so hasn't been seconded yet, right? Oh, it hasn't been seconded? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, I thought so too. So we can call for that vote. Commissioner Passenger? Aye. Commissioner Hansen? Nay. Commissioner Simmons? Nay. Commissioner Nelson? Nay. Commissioner Carmen? Nay. Commissioner Culberson? Nay. Good day. Nay. Commissioner Casino. Well, I'm going to say hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to worry about that in comp plan review, and your, your reasoning makes a lot of sense, Scott. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. All right, with that, we're going to return back to um, agenda item four, where we will invite uh, Caitlin and um, Amelia back for some more grand mail stuff. And I think our last issue was on whether or not we want to keep a wetland or waterfront designation. It was the first issue there. Uh, I don't know if anybody is ready to move forward on that particular issue or if we should continue discussion on it. I think we need to break things down a little bit quicker. Go ahead. To answer Helen's question, until we finish with by the end. But Martha, when we discuss that in the SFP, it's in order to keep a wide, typically on a marine or a lake environment, wide in the front yard, water, so that you only have dock, boat, dock, boat, dock, boat, dock, boat. And that's the reason in this case we just have a creek, and that's not going to happen. So, well, and um, I took a second to look at some aerial maps um, when we were done the hearing. It doesn't look uh, like the land adjacent to the creek even has any real land left in that zone. Um, the other thing I keep in mind um, is that um, you know we were looking at what the current minimum lot widths are uh, that you've seen in your staff memo previously. Um, and it actually looks uh, like waterfront is smaller than some of the other laws. We do need to think that the intention would most likely make it easier to subdivide around the local areas when that was done. That's just my uh, intuition, I think. So that would make sense. Uh, yeah, but um, like I said, looking at the aerial images, it doesn't look like there is uh, a lot of land that that would even be applicable to anymore, just because it's, it's you know, like maybe there's one house and then there's a big stream buffer that you can see because there's a bunch of trees there still, uh, or there's just nothing on the property at all. So, um, yeah, like you said, is that something that we want to continue discussing or do you want to move on to land use amendments and then maybe come back? Does anybody have any heartburn with dropping the waterfront portion of this? Okay, then we're going to call it out the waterfront portion. Uh, let's see. Yeah. 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 
Proposals must be consistent with life planning policies and uh, plans, which have essentially built in the requirements of state law. Um, so I am basically just going to go through um, and we can talk about the properties as they come up. So, first one is Steel Hammer Trust, which is three parcels, about five acres. The current zone is R4, 16 for one acre, and they are proposing arterial commercial. Uh, there are uh, no water features on this property since that was a, um, a concern that was brought up. What are your thoughts on this proposal? Does it meet or not meet any of my policies? <coughs> For sure. Yeah, I think, um, oh, whoops. Okay, so do I just talk to, or do I talk into the mic, or what do I talk to? To the mic. Like that? Oh, wow. <laughs> How about there? Is that maybe we just need to point the mics at ourselves? That's really what it comes to. Okay. Here. All right. Well, to my mind, um, this is linked to the Wilmofsky property because the Wilmofsky property is proposing to create to expand the UGA with a, a 416 designation, right? And that's what would be taken away from this one. So for me, I was looking at that and thinking about, you know, it would be nice to understand why this particular area was zoned the dense area in the first place. Um, and I, I don't really understand that, but it does make sense to me to encourage, um, residential development along that 198th street corridor because um, it just seems like you could do your transportation planning for you know neighborhoods and i know safety is a real issue uh, that was raised in the public comment um, i think maybe this original plan was based on an idea that there was going to be a kind of an urban retail village or something and well this, this only plan knows. was before great wolf actually was built yeah it? uh predates great wolf. yeah i think it does yeah, yeah. yeah. so that's yeah. probably why things have changed so much right so <laughs> so i think to me they're related um, I can, you know, I was having heartburn about it, thinking that it was just a removal of some dense housing. But I think if, you know, if we were adding, adding the the Wolmowski and subtracting sort of the residential there, I could certainly live, you with, live with that. With that, yeah. So I mean, the, there's a larger issue of, you know, the adding and subtracting I'd like to address, but. But that that you know, sort of pairing those two properties kind of makes sense to me. Yeah, so that is definitely something. Consideration. Um, the R four sixteen R four R four two sixteen for one acre <laughs> um, was zoned in that section because the intention of that zone is to be in the center of the urban growth area, to be where um, you know along those main roads, to be in the core with. Uh, and adjacent to commercial uses. Um, so, um, so if we look at um, at this property, the Lomonsky property, one thing to keep in mind is that R4, um, I'll just call it R4 for now, uh, is adjacent to RRR one to five, um, which is uh, a very low density. Um, 
and has R3 on the other side. So one thing to consider is that um, the R4 zone might be too dense for this. Um, uh, and you would have the option of proposing R3 as well. Um, the other thing to consider is that um, expanding the urban growth areas has different requirements than the uh, other land use proposals. We have to show that um, if we are expanding the UGA, um, that there is an overriding public benefit beyond the area proposed for inclusion. So um, the Buildable Lands Report stated that we do not have a need for additional residential, commercial, or industrial uses. Um, based on how the land uses are laid out, it is anticipated to accommodate the growth over the next 20 years. Um, we are looking at a property that uh, could potentially be removing 19 to 78 residential uses. Um, and the Wolofsky property, as is zoned, could add 116 to 464 residential uses. So it's a pretty significant difference uh, in what this property could accommodate versus what we're removing. Um, I had actually provided the three properties um, that were requesting an expansion to the UGA as almost a separate discussion, just because we have to show that there is that overriding public benefit. Um, we need to have reasoning to back it up in our decision. Uh, so if, if there is reasoning, um, we can talk about that. Um, but we're not showing that we need additional residential units right now. I, I just had a real quick question on that too, um, which was, uh, is it the case that you can adjust, um, and that's not to argue for or against this particular thing, but um, can you adjust the boundaries of the UG, UGA so that if you were to like squeeze it like a balloon, you know, if you were to add it, here but subtract it somewhere else would you still have to go through that process of justification of the expansion or would it not be regarded as an expansion yes uh, you would go through the process of justifying the expansion um, but it would be with the policies that you have to justify reducing so there are separate uh, countywide planning policies that address uh, reducing uh, the urban growth area and in the past when the urban growth area has been modified it has generally been um, an addition in some areas and removal in others um, i want to say that historically the last time that was done it was more to remove critical areas from uh, the urban growth area but um, yeah you haven't ever removed property from urban growth areas because of just because of getting developed not to date All right. I, I, so my question, go, go ahead. because, and I mean, yeah, I mean, this just helps. I mean, I'm sorry to sort of front load it here, but it sort of helps to think mm -hmm. about the different properties. <laughs> Cause I'm looking at the, um, the planned industrial park area, you know, on the, on the South end of the UGA and wondering if that's kind of expendable as far as the UGA goes. I mean, <clears throat> there's not a shortage of industrial land according to the buildable lands report, like there's a lot of wiggle room, like that's, there's a lot of industrial land according to that. And it wouldn't hurt the plan to subtract some of the industrial land. And, you know, when I look, when I was looking at like the FEMA flood maps, you know, this is, I can see why this was zoned as industrial park because it's sort of like being lapped by the hundred year flood zone and you know which is now the 50-year flood zone or whatever it's going to be once the are you talking about done. the Destin property no i'm talking about this part of the UG, the current uga oh okay and i'm wondering if you know we can sort of do a little horse trading with with this <laughs> of the... this is mainly tribal owned land here if i remember <laughs> is it i mean i don't know uh, this here would be um no Okay, well, and it'd be between the bottom. I mean, but yeah, well, 
it's a pretty good guess that in the end there's probably yeah I mean it's like everything up here around this intersection and all this thing it's all tribal and this sorry right I, I was just going to say, uh, yes, we could look at other areas uh, that we could reduce the urban growth area, but the main question that we have to answer is what is the overriding public benefit? Uh, and increasing residential uses is not because we don't have a need for it. I, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like our need analysis is based off of the, the current, the existing zoning. And the existing zoning was made before the development of a lot of stuff that's happened down there, including Great Wolf. So all of that to me seems like it's a question that you know 20 years ago we totally missed the guess on how this was going to develop down there in the wrong direction. So to me, it was very easy to say that the projections from 20 years ago were wrong, and that if we do add in some of this industrial stuff, which we should do, and and continue to develop this arterial commercial. There is going to be a need for the housing down there. And so adding in um, some more land for units, I think it's to me, it seems like it's, it's an easy thing to do. But go ahead, tell me where I'm wrong. <laughs> you are correct that this was zoned a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, but the buildable lands analysis is a study that uh, TRPC does, and I believe the most recent one is in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so and they look at land uses, um, what the population growth and um, employment growth is expected to look like over the next 20 years, um, what the land would look like further developed um, and, and whether or not it's meeting all of those requirements. And so, um, and there was a, a link to that, I believe in your staff memo if you want yeah. to look mm -hmm. it over, but, uh, but those are all up to date. And those all use OFM's population projections? They start uh, with OFM population projections. Um, they sort of, do some of their own analysis on top of that. Okay. And I would assume none of those would have factored in this new reality that people don't necessarily have to live where they work anymore. Oh, uh, so, no, so, we need to start looking. Well, the, my, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I mean, I, I think I've all bets are off as far as this. Prior assumptions. Well, well I, I, th I mean, I just wanted. I mean, I think. I mean, I'm just remembering. But I think what the buildable lands report said was that there was huge excess of industrial land. You know, that it's it sort of you know of the three or whatever categories. You know, the industrial. I, I don't remember what the buildable land report how it divided, but I think they said. I mean, it was just a ridiculously huge amount of industrial land according to the buildable lands report. I mean, you could. You could easily change the proportions within the UGA. There was the it's the report said. I mean, this is my problem. I I can't justify expanding the boundaries of the UGA because there is no need to do so. But I can see adjusting the boundaries of the UGA and changing the proportions of what what's residential, what's industrial, you know, what's com commercial because it, to reflect you know, current realities. Mm -hmm. and that's why I'm, you know, that's why I'm asking these questions because it seems like a major purpose now, as Chair Casino said, is this absorption of the residential development because the surrounding community still wants to maintain its rural character. And so it's a, it's a sprawl absorber in a sense in that way, plus being connected to jobs. Just what would be the the consequence of taking Maple Lane out of the UGA. So we, in order to do what Commissioner Weaver was talking about, what we call a net zero um, UGA adjustment, um, the area would have that we're removing the UGA would have to comply with the area that it's getting removed from. So it can't be an urban area that you're removing already and stick it into a, a rural area. Does that make sense? Is Maple Lane? Or Maple, Maple Lane is fairly developed. built up um, and would be considered more of an urban area than it would be a rural area. So it's appropriate to be in the UG. It is appropriate to be in the UG. Go ahead, Mr. Day. Um, I was just wondering if we could get some clarity or maybe some examples on what um, an overriding public interest would look like. Uh, 
Well, one of the things that I've heard a lot about is a lot of this is private lands, which is not taxable. Uh, the community, the county, there's no tax base from any of that property that's there. Is some of the idea for creating the Steelhammer Family Trust area and the Deskin area and the Black Quarry area, is some of that to bring in uh, industry that would be taxable by the, the community and the county? I mean, because uh, that would be inside the UGA then. I mean, I'm just trying to understand why, why they're doing that. If there's so much land available down there, is it all belong to the tribe and then and they're not going to develop it? Does only the tribe can develop it? So we can't speak for the applicant. What we can say is that the desire the applicant has for that particular area that they currently own does not comply with the current zone. Right. And what they want to do with it isn't comply. Correct. Well, one of the things that we had asked for last time, you know, was the uh, communications with the tribal community. Uh, right. So I know that there was, um, I know that there was discussion previously, uh, especially during the uh, open houses. Uh, we do reference their plan in the Sudbury plan, um, and they will be uh, informed during the public comment period uh, and then the additional open houses. Um, so there will be more opportunity for them to comment on this. Um, they are not, they have not applied for land use. Well, they're not impact on this, basically. Yeah, well, they, they are, one of their properties is included in this um, and that was from discussion with them and that's the old highway 99 commercial corridor. Um, or the great three selling from oh. land industrial park to artillery or commercial. Yeah, and that's just, it's, it's really just, that's what's existing, so um, it wouldn't be significantly different to change that land use. Uh, okay. So, but the, the other question I have, we're talking about Wolnowski and the number of residential stuff. A 16 to one, is that like a whole bunch of duplexes? It, it could be an apartment building. It's just multi It could be apartment or duplexes, because on one acre, you can get 16 units in there, that's for mobile homes, and then you can buy yeah, it is, it is the highest density housing in the area. Okay, so the property behind it, adjacent to it, and in front of it, uh, what's it zone? Uh, so this off of Dakota and Isabella Lane stuff. It looked to me like there were duplexes right next door to that property. That's why I was wondering when I looked at the satellite image. Because a residential community that is residential, that has individual single family residences, to put a bunch of apartment complexes across the street from it or next door to it would not be beneficial for those residential homes. I think Brown it's duplexes. Three to six, huh? yeah, I think, I'm pretty sure it's duplexes on that. The, off the of um, brown, Isabella there. The, brown the dark brown is, is, is three to six and the light brown will be four to 16. Proposed. Yes, uh, and the yellow is RRR one to five. Mm -hmm. um, I, you're right; those properties do look smaller, um, but and I don't know what size they are. But they would the adjacent properties would not be able to further subdivide smaller than what that zone allows for. Commissioner uh, Carmen, you had something. Yeah, we're just back from the ten minutes ago. <laughs> you had said when we talked last time that future commercial. Demand for housing due to future commercial was not calculated into this. So you, you answered my question last time. Uh, employment forecasts are in the buildable lands report with the uh, population forecast. So they do consider whether or not jobs will bring people uh, into the town. Um, and based on generally how often people live in the town that they work in versus drive in and out. Um, so those those things are generally considered together, yes. But as Commissioner Day said, that's back before working wherever you want to work. 
Well, they so with OFM projections, they uh, also take a look at um, people in, people out, and not. Um, so I do think that that is consistent. Um, I mean, I know a lot of people have moved towns in the Midwest and whatnot to reach to buy a house that costs 600000 here for three hundred and fifty, and they're working out of their house. So we, we can look at that same analysis for this area. And the people live in Seattle, work in Seattle, can work out of their house right here and have a heck of a lot better environment. And I think the problem is that we don't have any data, and none of the analysis that we currently have right. incorporates that thinking but yeah. post pandemic. So, can that be used as rationale? For it, in for justifying, for justifying. Increasingly, increasingly huge. I, I don't think that there is, uh, I don't think we'd be able to provide that information. Uh, I don't know that we have any information that shows that that is happening. Uh, I mean, it is happening, but I don't know that we have any information that backs it up. Um, so we know how many, we know the county government, how many people are. In state government, how many people are working from home? I, mean, I got a lot of friends that work for the state, and they're never going back to an office. Yeah. I mean, as far as the land use analysis for the properties under the UGA, um, I think that if it is meeting the countywide planning policies, um, that that justification could be included. Uh, as far as an overriding public benefit for expanding the UGA, uh, that is something that um, I think we will talk to our county attorney a little bit more about, but I don't think they would qualify for that. Go ahead, Commissioner Reilly. I think I mean, if I'm, what I'm hearing is that, um, I mean, generally you think that these UGA boundaries are pretty much what we're gonna, I mean, we can't really do the squish the balloon thing is kind of, I mean, just to get that question answered, we can't really squish the balloon and squeeze it in here and push it out there. That's not really a, sorry. <laughs> That squish. Um, you can. We just have yeah. to have justification that meets okay. the countywide planning goals. And but do you you know having looked at this map, are there places where you think it would be like? That's why I was kind of looking at that southern part, and maybe not the Maple Lane part, but maybe the one further. I guess it would be the further. That would take I mean, further analysis. Okay. On our part, that is outside the scope of what the board of planning commissioners has charged us to do with the Grand Mountain Subarea Plan update, which is update the policies and bring them out of 1996. Six. Okay. <laughs> um, which we've done, and then take well, a look at all of the um, the eight amendments that are on the table, um, which we're doing in conjunction with the, the updated policies to make sure that they all talk to one another. But if we're looking at a comprehensive, if this is not a comprehensive review of the sub area, or revisioning of the sub area at this okay. time. So okay. that, that what you're asking for would be a more broader review of this particular sub area that we, we have not envisioned to do. Therefore, we have to take a, we have to take a hard look at it the staff because the board of county commissioners hasn't asked us to do that. Yeah, and I remember you said, you know, it's sort of like we don't have a city to talk to, so it's the county talking to itself yeah. about this. <laughs> so that makes it a little complicated. But, okay, well, that, I mean, that's really important for me to think about because um, I, I do not think that there are really, if you think of it in terms of are there grounds for expanding the UGA, I can't think of any real good justifications for doing that. So all of the properties that would be about expanding the UGA for me would be off the table and, and we'd have to be thinking instead about rezoning so that, you know, some of the kind of empty spaces in the, in the brown area, the three to six, maybe we might want to turn into denser residential or something like that, that we could think about, right? But, but we can't really think about changing the boundaries and you know, doing the balloon squishy thing. So uh, you know, that, that's really important for me because that really changes the way I think about some of these properties. So I, thanks. I think that um, 
and you were alluding to this earlier, when you look at these proposed changes, if we're just if we just focus on the ones that are residential, because a lot of these are arterial, commercial, or you know, industrial or something like that. When we just look at what has happened on the residential end, without changing the UGAs, but granting the uh, fire station and the steel steel hammer family trust land, we would actually be losing right. residential lands. Exactly. And I think that those areas being arterial commercial is not unreasonable, right. but then we would be losing those residential lots. And so because of that, I would like to see the Will Wilmoski stuff brought into the UGA, especially since it's only you know an eighth of a mile off of Highway 12. And Lord knows that we could use some more expensive housing down that way. And if that meant that there was a couple of big apartment complexes or a row of townhomes or some other higher density thing, an eighth of a mile off of Highway 12, that does not give me heartburn at all, especially when we're losing it down off of Highway 99. But making it possibly residential three to six units per acre instead of 16 to one. I don't, I don't really, the density part of that doesn't bother me so much because I don't think that the neighborhood characteristics of the stuff to the east of it, really, I don't think that's a huge deal. I would like to see higher density to get better efficiency of infrastructure and to afford cheaper housing. I think that that's a priority that we should seriously consider. Commissioner, some of you got your hand up. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how we could justify that. If we can justify bringing in, go ahead. Well, I, I just want to register that I disagree a little bit. Sure. The third, you know, the other option that we haven't talked about, again, it would be rezoning some of the, the three to six that's within the UGA up there. Because when I looked at the satellite imagery, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and we're talking about, you know, so it's not like telling people what to do with their property right now, but this is a planning infill process. There is a lot of infill opportunity there. So if it were rezoned to be um, for 16 in a lot of that area that's brown now, I think you could take I, care of that without having to expand the UGA necessarily. I, I think that's very worthwhile to do infill. The big difference being there is we don't actually know if the infill would happen and what kind of timelines that would happen or anything like that. But we do know that if we bring in Wilmofsky and give them their zoning, they're going to develop because they've come to the planning commission and told us that. They, they were regulars here for a long time. They'd show up every week for, well, for about two years. They were showing up every week saying that they, they are ready to build and they can't do it for an eighth mile off of Highway 12. So the immediate need for housing solved with Wilmoski, but I, I'm not saying infill's not good. Infill's great. I think it's fantastic. I just don't know if, if there's an incentive structure to get these people in dark brown to start infilling. But that gets us back to the justification question. And that would be my question. Is that kind of a consideration and overriding public benefit question? Well, providing Portable housing is a public policy goal of the counties. And the immediacy of the property of the. the, the, the mm -hmm. I'm not saying it right. Mm -hmm. This is all open for discussion. So go ahead. Well, I mean, yeah. So the other big issue is when, you know, there's density and then there's affordability. They're not the same thing, <laughs> which is, you know, I mean, I want to see. But there is correlation there. Well, sure, sort of, except that you can have situations like, for example, um, and this is something that the, that H Bill 2022 mm -hmm. uh, addresses, you know, you not only have to think about um, building for affordability or, you know, or, or at least knowing, having the data, doing the study to have the data of how much of a gap there is between the housing that's being built and the housing that's affordable, but you also have to think about displacement. And from what I, you know, I mean, maybe we all need to do a tour of Grand Mound, I don't know, but it looks to me like there's a lot of low income housing um, down and, and including mobile homes down in that South area where if you densified that, that chunk that we are talking about right now, the, you know, the, the, the um, steel hammer and, and the firehouse, mm -hmm are 
actually, if you densified that, you might actually be displacing people by raising the property value. So it gets a little complicated. You know, it's not like more always or denser necessarily means affordable. I so, think the net analysis would be that there are more units and the more units, I mean, the more supply you have, the lower the prices go. And I think this is also probably a location that's not going to be the highest rents. No, it's not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you are we talking about the, the old most, Highway 99 I mean, part or the Wolmowski part? Area, I think. Because, yeah, I mean, I'm just saying you got to think about displacement too. So, I know. Here are the comment. Oh. Go ahead, Commissioner Petzinger. We'll come back to Commissioner Hanson. I don't understand this recurring argument about. Uh, Increase in the supply automatically decreases, or an increase in supply just automatically decreases the price of things. It's that's not how economics works. Even though everybody loves to say that over and over, that that's the first rule of economics. Never in the history of the world has an increase in supply of Ferraris decreased the cost of Fiat. I I disagree. Right, I was just going to mention to, no, to Commissioner Wheatley's point this uh, commercial zoning at the very bottom. Mm -hmm. I'm familiar with it because my grandparents' farm is like right here on 210. Um, but that area, some of it south of Old Highway 9, uh, it's mobile homes, but it's zoned commercial. And so eventually that will be housing that is lost mm -hmm. as it develops. And so there are situations like that um, where we're going to lose affordable housing just as we have it zoned currently. It's going to happen. So mm -hmm. adding affordable housing is probably a big concern in this area. So Chair, we are going to just 830 and there are eight overall amendments and we've only talked about a couple of them. Mm -hmm. Are there some that the commission as a whole want to move or like yeah we could with these let's you know parking lot them and we can move them on but um this is a particular issue with board kind of commissioners that they would like to see moved forward in a timely fashion. Well I I've just heard that some of the commissioners was We'll approve all of them, and if the planning commission decided to approve all of these, is that something that could actually be done, or would that be? So there are additional steps that have to occur. Um, mm -hmm. If it's all of them, that includes the expansions. There is a extra step that is involved, and it goes to the help me, Kate, what's the name of it? The growth management, management area. Board. No. Um, uh, Urban growth area of Snakeover community? Yeah, it's something like that. It's, it's, it's a, for TRPC. For TRPC. Uh, so it's a stakeholder group that is made up of the county and the cities um, to review this particular um, recommendation, whatever that may be, coming out of the planning commission, if it's to expand. Um, that then would go to the Board of County Commissioners. Um, so that would, that extra step that only occurs if there is. The recommendation for any one of the expansions that are on this particular expansions outside the UGA, right? To expand the UGA, and so that would be all the industrial, the arterial, arterial, commercial, and then possibly the Lomoski properties, right? The black. Yes, the black Lomoski and Desk. Yeah. yeah. Right. And they would essentially provide their own recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners along with yours. Excuse me, uh, Jackson is welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, no, Jackson is not located within the UGA, but they are not requesting an expansion of the UGA. Thank you. Maybe we should look at the ones, you know, maybe the way that we should run through this is to set aside for later discussion the ones that are within the UGA, because I, you know, I have some pretty strong opinions about some ones on the outside and some questions about the ones on the outside. Those are the ones we most quickly, the most critical could be disposed of. 
what what kind of timeline is the board hoping for out of us? They would like to see. They would like to see it this year. So but we have not necessarily this evening. <laughs> right. Not this evening. Okay. <laughs> they would like to see it. I think we need some more discussion. It's been five years. I think we do. I think we need to uh, focus our priorities on these, yeah. on these eight and how we're going to do that. And I think that Commissioner Wheatley is right that we probably should break it up in what's going to expand the GTA, what's not going to expand the GTA. Other than I do think there's probably something there's probably going to be a connection between the steel hammer and the fire department and the Lamosky. I, I think that. So, um, does anybody have a suggestion on which way to focus our next work session? What they like to see? Well, I think I'd like to. I guess I don't know what staff has, but um, the water sewer. What's the? Because I, I know when this first came, this. I had asked about it because it was maybe more on the east side of my time, but fine. And kind of the suggestion I got was that going across that five and water is sure is not in the plan. So, what is the question? The question is is there a plan to provide urban services to the properties east of Idaho. My understanding is that uh, the both the water and sewer plan uh, are planning to provide services to every property in the EPA within the next 20 years. Including if we made this expansion? Yes. Um, is Joe or Joe is still on? Hello, Joe. Yes, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> so I, I can speak to that issue, Kate. Um, so, so yeah, we, we have an ongoing uh, sewer planning process where we're looking at uh, providing service uh, within the UGA, which is the service area for both the water and sewer systems. Um, part of our, our sewer planning effort, which will conclude next July, will also be looking at um, how expansion of the UGA in these areas that have been discussed this evening uh, would affect our ability to provide uh, uh, utility service. And Commission, just before Commissioner Wheatley, Joe, can you tell us who you are and who you're with for the record? Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, sure. No, uh, Joe Plahuda, Senior Water Resource Engineer. Um, I'm with Thurston County Public Works, so I oversee the uh, capital program uh, for the water and sewer utilities. I had a real specific question about that. Um, the Duskin property, I looked at the 2012 map. Uh, Sewer, you know, sewer that had both the UGA and sort of the area outside of the UGA, what was being looked at, it sort of had a boundary around it. And very clearly that Duskin property was not within that boundary of the 2012 map, it looked like to me. So, so it's really not, I mean, it would only, you'd only look at it if there were an interest in developing that property, right? It's, it's kind of, Wait, where's the cart and where's the horse here? <laughs> well, we have we have uh, infrastructure immediately outside of that boundary, so immediately to the to the west. Um, if that were to be um, annexed into the UGA, um, we would uh, be able to extend services to serve that property. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it answers it. Oh, the east of the five. Yeah, yeah. Well, back to how do we want to focus our next work session? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to note that there's roughly $7 million in this capital improvement plan for the water and sewer system in Grand Mound in the UGA. And just to note that, that's, as I understand it, that number would go up as if the UGA was expanded. Yeah. Um, not. Not necessarily. I mean, there's a certain amount of growth that's um, assumed in those numbers. Uh, some of the projects that we, we have identified currently in our CIP are two new well sources um, to accommodate uh, additional water demand within the UGA. We also have an expansion of the wastewater treatment plant um, and a project to produce reclaimed water, um, which is only required as a condition of withdrawing under our, our water rights. 
So um, there's a certain amount of growth assumed in each of those, those capital projects. Um, I can speak on the water side since we've completed our water system planning document. Um, currently, we're serving about 1,300 residential, equivalent residential units. Um, and with the existing system, no capital improvements, no system expansion, uh, we can serve about uh, 2,300 equivalent residential units on the, on the water side. So, um, you know, from where we sit now, we have the capacity to serve approximately 1,000 additional um, single family connections. And again, that's water only sewer. Uh, we're in the process um, of evaluating that as part of the current planning effort. Okay, so how, which one of these, which direction we want to focus our next work session on? Um, I know we spent a lot of time on the residential end of this and it didn't come to any conclusions yet, but would you like to see us work on the Deskin and the Black Lake Quarry, you know, uh, so the big, the big ones outside. The big ones that are outside the UGA that are asking to come in. Yeah. Can we? Because it's like a court expansion. I think I calculated it would expand it if we, if, if we accepted everything, it would expand the UGA by like 24% or something, so. Okay, so all the stuff, yeah, yeah, all that stuff that's outside the UGA there and then the Black Lake Quarry stuff all the way down to 196. And if we could have some, um, again, like the, the hydrology, like I, I don't really, you know, the map of the Black Lake Quarry area in particular, like a little more information about what that water stuff is, is sort of what the hydrology there is. And if that's a lammer that, that it's right next to, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. All right. Um, um, Go ahead. I'd like to see where the tribal property is, where we don't really have a lot of control. Uh, all, all of the tribal property or just the south? Within the UGA. Okay. Is that, you asked that? Oh, no, I'm just, um, sometimes it can be difficult um, based on the law because sometimes it's trust land, sometimes it's individual owners. Um, we can definitely put together which land is trust land. Um, Probably trust, because that's where they're gonna have control. So it's a, a zero property taxpayer, is that what you mean? Right. Yeah, it's a zero dollar taxpayer. Yes, yeah, so a lot applies either way, yeah. uh, even if it is. But um, yeah, and we'll be able to find, we'll only be able to know and find those that are in our system as tribal and trust land. So we can look for that kind of information, but um, we can't make guesses on single other properties. That's fair. Yeah. Well, the auditor's office, I mean, they have a list that shows if they pay taxes or not. So we, we don't get that kind of information. What we can do is pull the information based on um, what the um, assessor has out there as far as who owns the property and tribal and trust does come up. Yeah, but travel trust is that's where they're going to build commercial stuff primarily. So is uh, they also have um, goals to build a residential units, um, and I think some of that is in their economic development plan. Mm -hmm. um, is the intention um, to to try to look and see if there is an overriding public benefit to provide additional industrial and commercial? Land offset area that is that's one, not one of them. Yeah. Now you raised another another. I just want to make sure that we know. I was like, like I was assuming that that the tribal trust land primarily would be, end up being commercial, but now you raised that there also have residential areas and and there are there's a quiet yeah. and so do we count those in our plan? Uh, the properties are. The properties are shown in Grand Mill. They're shown in the comprehensive plan and our land use mapping. Um, since it can change anytime, they can buy properties um, and the laws change around it. That's not something that we necessarily identify. Um, so uh, the laws, we, we 
don't have jurisdiction over their lands. Yeah. Uh, even though they are shown in our plans. So they have their own water store? Uh, uh, maybe the other Joe, are you there? <laughs> Yeah, what, what um, Does the tribe participate in any of the water or sewer facilities in the Grand Island PGA? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the last part of that? Does the tribe participate in any of the water or sewer facilities? Um, no, not beyond just uh, purchasing capacity in our systems uh, as any other customer would. Well, as a brewery and distillery and a water park, they must be the biggest wow. customer. Yeah. Yeah. They, are. They, they are. They have paid a, a lot in general facility charges over the over the last decade. All right. Okay. okay well, I think we kind of set you on a direction to um, be able to help us understand some of this more in our next work session. Uh, yes, um, <laughs> it, it would be helpful to know specifically what you would like to know about some of these properties. Commissioner sure Wheatley, you want to? Well, like I said, I'd, I'd like to understand the hydrology of this Black Lake Quarry. I mean, I'm a, I'm a bit puzzled by, by the Black Lake Quarry one, and maybe just understanding, like with their applications, like would it help us to see the applications? Like, did they state? The, the intended use of the property and the reason why they're asking for an expansion of the UGA, or do they just kind of ask for a category of land? Uh, it could help. Um, I'm not recalling right now. I believe this application specifically does say what their intention is. Um, not all of them do. Uh, and if we approve it, that doesn't necessarily hold them to do exactly what their intention is. Yeah, was. I would be a little concerned that we start moving yeah. away from legislative decisions into specific permit application influence and that kind of well, scares me a little bit. I, I would like to understand hydrology because it looks like it's a lot of water from the map picture. Uh, yeah, um, are there other properties? Yeah, why not? Yeah. So those are man-made water bodies. Yeah. They might be man-made water bodies. Yeah, yeah. 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 All, right. Oh, all right. So we're going to move on now to other business item number 10, staff updates. With any manager should go. So the first one is to remind everybody that you should have seen a vehicle from out from Zena. Um, asking for some dates for a special uh, meeting or a special session. It would be a joint session with the uh, Olympia Planning Commission, and that would be to go over the uh, Olympia joint plan. And just reminding everybody that we do need those built out so that we can find the most appropriate date in those two weeks so that we can move the joint plan forward. And I would ask that you guys quickly. Because even though I set my hand, I mean, I can't keep all those dates open forever. So, out of courteous, being courteous to the rest of us, send your doodle pool in. And thank you to those who have done that. Uh, I have one. a clarifying question. Sure. So, okay. I just wasn't certain about the planning or timing. Are, are we looking in those those months of having like four meetings in one single month? That is a very good potential. Yes, we asked for dates within two weeks that are the off planning commission weeks so that we could find one of those two weeks to have a joint plan meeting or a meeting jointly, I should say, with um, the city of Olympia. Um, planning commission. If two are, two meetings are necessary, then yes, that would be four meetings in one month. Yes, I'm hoping for one meeting. All right. Uh, next, um, there are a number of items that you all have seen on the pandemic. Uh, we might some updates to you on those. Uh, the first one is on the 27th. Um, there will be a public 
hearing um, on the 27th, that is the CAO non performing chapter, and that will be at 5 p.m. on the 27th. Uh, on the, oh, my day's wrong. 824, which is the emergency housing ordinance, uh, we will be having a briefing at 9 30, and I have not put the date on that one that is I'm not taking. On October 4th, there will be a public hearing um, at 3 30 for the uh, habitat conservation plan. Then at 8 o'clock, on 9 29, there's a QA, QA session. Um, that I'll be holding for an hour between 12 and 1 um, for the public. So, if anybody wants to have any more information about that, go to And then, on the uh, excuse me, um, on 10 2, we will be having a briefing with the board for the wireless briefing. And I want to check that date one more time. Oh. Yeah, that's what I'm the 12th of October? 12th of October. Okay. Here we go. On the wireless. That is on the wireless. That is. Could you repeat the, the time on that again? Is that 9.30 a.m.? That is 8 p.m. In the emergency housing audience uh, is going on the 28th of September. Yeah, that's at 9.30. Okay. And those are my updates. All right. Is there, I'm sorry, has there been any decisions about when we'll be moving? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I'm used to that. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so we've been notified that we should prepare at least um, for the first wave of girls in early November. However, because we're going to be two phases or waves of move um, for all of us to get over there and some some stuff I think is not needed um, for this. We will be continuing planning commission meetings here in this room through the end of the year to make things as smooth as possible. Do we have chairs or do we need to bring cushions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, is, there, is, there is furniture in the buildings. Um, it's still coming in. I did see it um, this morning. Um, it looks great in the board room that we will all be in. It will be much larger. Um, we'll have more elbow room. <laughs> That is the intention at this time, yes. Do you, do you mind if I ask a staff member? Sure. Uh, we are still um, looking forward to associate planners. We do have um, this. Well, that's better than you were. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, move on to calendars and change of items. So on October 5th, uh, we're looking at um, Ag CAO again in May. I don't know if we'll have more on Granny Honor not ready for then, but that's a possibility. But certainly we're hoping for some ag CAO stuff. Is there anybody here that does not think they'll be able to make October 5th? I definitely won't be here in person, but I think I can. Okay. Okay. Then on October 10th, that might be a special meeting with Olympia, but we don't know for sure. We got to get our doodle polls in. So um, we'll work on it. On October 19th, we're going to do some more Grand, Grand Mountain sub area planning stuff. We may or may not have a public hearing in our house. Well, we probably won't have time to schedule a public hearing. Yeah, yeah, we'd have to set it up farther than that. So, is anybody thinking that they might not be able to make October 19th? Okay, we should have a full house. Does anybody have anything for the good of the order? I know for the business this meeting is adjourned.